Lord, thank you for this morning. Great, great, great to be at the Brothers today. And Lord, what a celebration we had last week with Sherman and our anniversary and the tournament and so many, so many stories, so many uh, things occurred. And we just give you thanks and praise for your provision. You're a great and mighty God, and we look forward to opening the Word of God today. Speak directly to our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Mr. Greg. All right. Thank you. You good? All right. Good morning. Good morning. And I was talking to them. So. Uh, who missed all of last week? Everything. Oh, d you don't want to raise your hand. That was kind of a rhetorical question. Uh, <laughs> he did. <laughs> that was a great week, wasn't it? Man, man. And uh, what's the day? Okay, two days ago was officially our 21st anniversary of the first day TJW met. Who was in the room that day? A few, okay, one, two, three, a few, few of us here. Where did we meet that day? Super salad. Anybody remember super salad? That's where it all started, super salad. We had, and we keep debating, we shouldn't debate. I'm sure if Rod goes back to day one, he could remember, but it's, it was 30 to 35 guys, different churches, different denominations, didn't know what we were doing. Everybody just got a personal invitation from Rod or Dan, and we came into this little restaurant. I was on staff at a church at the time, and I'm like, all right, I'll go. Rod invited me, and I'm like, so I'm not in charge of anything, right? I could just be a guy. I can just sit around a table with some other guys and say, yeah, man, you just come and sit. You just come and enjoy fellowship. And I hadn't done anything like that in I don't know how long. As I'm telling you, that, that was the start for me. And do I love mornings? Okay, you've been here a while. I hate them. But I, I have loved the mornings with TJW ever since. Um, so, praise the Lord, and thank you guys. Uh, so many of you, most of you, I did not know prior to TJW. Uh, God has uh, just blessed me with so many dear friends and brothers and guys that I get to hang out with a little bit here now and will one day hang out with for an eternity. And so that is just cool. And God gets all the glory. We get all the joy. Amen. All right. Well, we're still in Philippians. We're in chapter 2. Uh, hopefully you've got your notes there in front of you. Let me read the passage that we're looking at today. Verses 14 through 18. And Paul says this. Do all things. Remember, what would, what would Dan say? That the Greek for all means all, and Dan was right. Do all things, listen to this, without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Verse 17, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. There's a guy by the name of Jeff Collins. He's a pastor and he's a, an evangelist. Uh, um, uh, I don't know about advantage. He's a pastor, and he's also been involved with a ministry that has had um, a wide impact. And <clears throat> I read this the other day, and it's a it's a it's a first person personal story from him. So I just want to share this with you as we begin. He said it had been a trying at our love and action office at five o'clock on a Friday. I was looking forward to having a quiet dinner with friends. And then the phone rang. Jeff, it's Jimmy. I heard a quivering voice say. Jimmy, who 
suffered from several age-related illnesses, was one of our regular clients. I'm really sick, Jeff. I've got a fever. Please help me. I was angry. After a 60-hour work week, I didn't want to hear about Jimmy. But I promised to be right over. Still, during the drive, I complained to God about the inconvenience. The moment I walked in the door, I could smell the vomit. Jimmy was on the sofa, shivering and in distress. I wiped his forehead, and then I got a bucket of soapy water to clean up the mess. I managed to maintain a facade of concern, even though I was raging inside. Jimmy's friend, Russ, who also had AIDS, came down the stairs. The odor made Russ sick as well. As I cleaned the carpet around Russ's chair, I was ready to explode inside. And then Russ startled me. I understand. I understand. What, Russ? Jimmy asked weakly. I understand who Jesus is, Russ said through tears. He's like Jeff. And weeping, I hugged Russ and I prayed with him. And that night, Russ trusted Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. A God who had used me to show his love in spite of myself. Paul starts this passage out. Do all things without grumbling and disputing that you may be blameless and innocent. Children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights. The fact is, guys, if I'm being honest and transparent, I am more often than not a lot like Jeff. But that's not what the Scripture calls us to be like. That's not how it calls us to live, is it? Biblical living does all things without grumbling, without complaining, without disputing. That's what the gospel calls you and I to do. That's how it calls us to live our lives. I put a quote from Dr. John R. W. Stott. He is one of the brilliant men of <clears throat> our recent time and a godly, godly pastor and, and uh, commentator. This is what he said. You know what your own country is like. I'm a visitor and I wouldn't presume to speak about America, but I know what Great Britain is like. I know something about the growing dishonesty and corruption, and immorality, violence, pornography, the diminishing respect for human life and the increase of abortion. The question is often answered, whose fault is it? Well, let me put it like this, he said. If the house is dark at night, there's no sense in blaming the house. That's what happens when the sun goes down. The question should be not whose fault is it, but where is the light? If meat goes bad, there's no sense in blaming the meat. That's what happens when bacteria is allowed to breed unchecked. The question shouldn't be whose fault is it. The question should be where is the salt? If society becomes corrupt like a dark night or a stinking fish, there's, there's no sense in blaming society. That's what happens when fallen human society is left to itself and human evil is unrestrained and unchecked. The question shouldn't be whose fault is it. The question should be where is the church? End quote. So here's your first fill-in for today. Every generation of believers, every generation of God followers is confronted with a crisis of faith where they must choose between assimilating into the culture at large a, a, a passive 
uh, accommodation to a godless world. Or here's your next fill in. Yesterday I said, don't write this down, I said a total commitment to God. Now I don't know why I even said that because that's not the word I would normally choose. And at the end of our time when we were discussing this on our Zoom call, um, Scott said, hey, I, on that part on commitment, he said, man, I really, he said, I, I really feel that that is maybe better um, explained as consecration. Our total consecration. And I said, I agree with that. In fact, more than the words uh, commitment, I actually like the word surrender. So you can write consecration or surrender, whichever one uh, you think you can spell easier, okay? <laughs> or put them both in there. But I, that's what it calls for, total, absolute consecration to Christ alone, a strict adherence to the Word of God. That's what is called for from us, a, a total surrender, palms up, I have nothing to offer, I am at your mercy. Whatever you say, wherever you tell me to go, whatever you tell me, to, I am at your mercy. A total surrender, a total consecration of our lives. Listen, guys, the Philippian church was at a crossroads. And I don't think it's a huge stretch to say that today in our time, we, we are at a crossroads as well as a church, as a people of God. Man, we could go on and on and on about what society is turning into today. It's... It is absolutely mind-boggling, isn't it? I cannot believe what some people believe and that others believe it's okay to believe that. It's, it, it's like we're living in an alternate universe. This is where the church has to be the church, man. We can't uh, mince words. We can't parse words and you know try to make sure that Nobody's offended by something. The Bible and its message is offensive. Jesus offended every time he spoke. That's one of the reasons they wanted him on the cross. They, they were offended by him all the time. Now, I'm not, I'm not purporting that we go out looking to offend. I'm saying we stand true. We hold fast to the word of God. We have to do that. Remember, when Paul wrote this little letter, he was confined to a Roman jail cell. And we see here in this letter, in fact, this passage specifically, a crisis facing Paul's generation and how he struggled with it himself. The simple fact is this. And I put it on your notes. Paul can either obey the Roman authorities and he could just quit preaching the gospel message altogether. Or he could continue to preach the gospel message and face the wrath of Rome. And we know what he chose to do, right? He did the latter. Well, let's look at some clues about how Paul makes his decision here and what what will he refuse to compromise? What, what, will he, what will he give up? What will he cling to when everything else fails? These are some of the same questions that you and I must answer as well. Because in life, men, you will always be asked to make important decisions that will determine what kind of person you will become or who or what you will worship, and here's your fill-in, and to what extent you will obey. Every day, sometimes instantaneously, guys, life will demand that you choose one thing over another. We're always having those, those choices to make. We're constantly pressed to choose our priorities. How will we spend our time? How will we spend our money, what books will we read, what movies will we watch, who will we marry, what shows will we turn on the TV in the evening, when should we speak, when should we remain silent. In this passage today, Paul offers 
two great alternatives. He says this, that we can either assimilate to what he calls this crooked and twisted generation there in verse 14, or, or you can choose to stand out as bright lights in a very dark world. Here's your feeling. The problem is this. It's not always easy to tell the difference. Paul calls his own generation here crooked. Now, it's interesting that the Greek word crooked is where we get our word today, scoliosis. Curvature of the spine. You see, sometimes the wrong choice looks Maybe a lot like the right one. The difference is that the wrong one is twisted and bent. Now, maybe sometimes it's ever so slightly, but it is. And the results of that are contrasted against a bright shooting star against total darkness. So how do we know? How do we know the difference well, listen to Paul's counsel to the Philippian believers. And, and, and this is what I want to focus on for the rest of our time this morning. I'm going to read the first two verses, 14 and 15. Do all things without grumbling and disputing, that you be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Verse 16, here's where we're going to camp holding fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ I may be found, I, I may be proud, Paul says, that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. So that phrase at the first part of verse 16 is the title of the talk today. So maybe you figured it out. That's kind of where we want to we wanna hang out here. That phrase is a very graphic and visual reminder, holding fast to the word of life. It's a visual reminder of the white-knuckled grip that Christians must always have on the word of God. That's your fill-in. You ever thought of it that way? A white-knuckled grip on God's word. It literally means to hold on to something with all your life, with all your might, with all your strength. In fact, it might even better be translated to clutch something or even to squeeze whatever it is. Let me try to illustrate this with uh, just a metaphor that I, I read the other day when I was preparing for this. I think it really explains this, or it gives us a mental picture even of what I mean to hold fast. This was the story. Imagine that you're a rock climber. Do we have any rock climbers here? Because they, those dudes are tough. Don't shake hands with a rock climber, man. I mean, they will crush your hand. But imagine you're a rock climber and you're patiently and you're methodically working your way up a jagged rock face on this sheer cliff. Just get that in your mind. If you've seen Cliffhanger before, you know, think of something, you know, like that. Every muscle in your body ripples as you exert your strength in the climb. I would like to do it just to see that happen because my muscles have not rippled in years. <laughs> I'm glad Roger isn't here today. He would say something. You get that picture, though. I mean, listen, as you pause and you look down to see what's below you, the threat of the fall into the canyon below is absolutely chilling. What do you do? You chalk up your hands. Well, you can't do it this way, okay? <laughs> but you chalk up your hands and you grip the face of that mountainside. You grip that rock. You dig your fingers into the crevice and all the strength of your body is focused on the next handhold. You know that your firm grip on that rock saves you from disaster. Friends, when Paul 
tells us to hold fast to the word of life here in verse 16, it is with that same risk in mind. I don't want you to ever see that or read that the same. Because I've read that passage I don't know how many times and I've never really got that picture in my mind as Paul is telling the church at Philippi and because of God's grace and mercy 2,000 years later he's telling you and me and every generation that's come before us hold fast to the word of life get a grip on God's word and do not let go it is the rock that secures us in our life to release your grip on the word of God and the truth that it holds spelled, spells both theological and moral disaster to maintain your grip is to rely on the rock that is unchanging the rock that is unbreakable the rock that is unmoving that's the rock you see on your notes, I, I'm guessing that probably everyone in here, whether you know exactly what it means, you've probably heard the word sola scriptura before. Uh, it's a Latin phrase that simply means scripture alone. It means that every doctrine of theology, every moral controversy, even every personal decision that you and I make must be made on the basis of Here's your feeling of the authority of Scripture alone. The phrase itself speaks solely of the absolute truth and priority of Scripture. This phrase goes all the way back to the Reformation. In fact, sola scriptura is the first of the five solas of the Reformation. Scripture alone, Christ alone, faith alone, grace alone to the glory of God alone. Those are the five scripturas, or, or th the five solas. And sola scriptura kicks that off. Sola scriptura then by definition excludes other sources of authority as having a binding authority. Not any authority, not, not, not some authority, not a little authority. A binding authority over our lives. That makes sola scriptura absolutely an exclusionary statement in fact the Westminster Confession says this about the Word of God I quote because the authority of the Holy Scripture for which it ought to be believed and obeyed get this depends not upon the testimony of any man or church but wholly upon God the author thereof who is truth himself and therefore the Bible is to be received because it is the Word of God. End quote. That, friend, is what we are to hold fast to. The Word of God. The idea here of Sola Scriptura, it's not something new. It's not, it's not something that was contrived by a few old church fathers. No, this is derived from the Word of God itself. Look at what Paul says in Colossians 2, verses 8 through 10. He says, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to elemental spirits. And in some, in some uh, uh, translations, the word, the elemental spirits phrase is translated the basic principles. I like that. According to the elemental spirits are the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority here's your feeling this passage is a passage of warning there are all sorts of ideologies out there right guys there are all sorts of traditions and and philosophies and uh, deceitful things that are waiting to trap you and me and to trip us up in life. I think it's the NIV. You guys know I usually read out of the ESV. I love it. But I started, I, I, you know, cut my teeth on the NIV for 30 years, you know. 
And I think it's the NIV who uses that alternate phrase, see to it that no one takes you captive through, and then it says, the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. Listen, men, we feel, every one of us, we feel the basic principles of this world every time we turn on CNN, every time we turn on MSNBC, every time we look at The View, uh, and by confession, I don't watch The View, but I've seen it enough on clips of, of news feeds that I read. Uh, every time we listen to some of these Don Lemonites and, 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 and other people, we, are, we understand the basic principles of this world. Listen, our students, our kids are bombarded by the basic principles of this world daily in the classrooms. Unconditional tolerance. What? Religious pluralism. Mm -mm. And yet, Scripture warns us so clearly. Do not be taken captive by anything that does not depend on Jesus Christ. And then we return to Philippians 2, and Paul continues to explain why he holds Scripture alone, why he clutches to it with all his might, as every one of us should do as well. What is Paul's primary motivation? What does he say? Verse 16, the first part, holding fast to the word of life. We've been talking about that. And now he shows us his motivation. So that in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Now, this is not the kind of pride that, that we might think of. This is, a, this is not about him. It's about how he lived his life. It's about the glory that goes to God, not to him. That's, that's the proudness. That's the pride that he's talking about. Here. You see, here's your feeling. Paul doesn't want to come to the end of his life and find that he has been unfaithful to his calling. He doesn't want to find that he has been unfaithful in his position as an apostle. Now, I don't know about you, but I realize that one day it's going to happen. One day, I'm going to have to face God at the judgment. For all the things that I did, all the things that I taught, all the things that I believed, all the things that I said, And only speaking for myself here, I would much rather have God say on that day, Greg, I don't know why you took the Bible so seriously. You could have loosened up a little bit. I would rather hear God say that to me than for him to say, Greg, you have seriously dishonored my name by departing from my word. I'd rather take it far more seriously than not take it serious at all. Here's your last feeling. You do not want to have lived your life in vain, men. You do not want to die and face Christ and have him tell you that you, are, that you are kicking against him most of the time rather than submitting to him. Men, sola scriptura, scripture alone must become for you and for me more than a rallying cry from past generations. It is now our generation's turn to pick up the banner and to declare the glory of of Christ and to proclaim the excellencies of his word. Once you personally adopt sola scriptura as the undergirding principle, as the basic principle in your life, you will find peace and obedience that, that you, you never could have imagined when your heart was still in rebellion to him. If you struggle, I put in your notes, if you struggle with deep theological issues of our day, and there's a lot of them, right? Abortion, homosexuality, the moral decay of our society, uh, unconfined violence. Uh, as I was putting this together the other day, I read the article 
uh, I think it was last Friday, you remember the FBI raided the home of an evangelist in Pennsylvania? I found out yesterday, Rod knows who this guy is. This guy spoke at some of the conferences that Rod has spoke at. Here's this guy. He is, he's been just sharing the love of Jesus for years and years and years. At 7 a.m., 30 armed agents, guns drawn, handguns and rifles, approach his house. They pound on his door. He has seven young children. They are screaming in terror on the other side, not knowing what is going on. He's trying to get his children calmed down and tell the people, listen, I'll open the door, but please, I, I've got children, young children in here. They continue to pound on the door. He finally opens the door. These kids are screaming as their daddy is arrested and taken away at gunpoint. Why? Why was he arrested? He was doing what he had been doing for years. He would drive an hour and a half into, I forget which city, I can't, my attention span, uh, I guess was not very good reading the article. He would go into this town and he would go to one of the, uh, uh, the murder clinics, the abortion clinics, and he would just plead with women. He'd just plead with them to, to think about what they were doing and to consider what they were doing. And on this particular day, there was, there was you know, people who were in opposition of, of his stance, my stance, your stance. And one particular gentleman was getting up in this guy's face and he was hurling all sorts of just vile profanity and he had taken a couple of his kids with him that day i think that was his kind of what he did he's teaching his children about the world about the love of god in a sick dying world and so he had a couple of his kids there and this guy's just hurling profanities even at the children and the guy kept telling him to, you know, just <laughs> decease, uh, you know, desist in this thing. And he would not. And so he pushed him very forcefully. And so I guess that that act evidently required that the FBI, with some 30 agents in full tactical gear and guns drawn, go and arrest him due to a some act that was signed that's that's the that's the world in which we live that's the that's the craziness of where we are john yeah yeah for those who couldn't hear he had a scratch on his finger uh and that was basically it but that's the world we live in guys if you're struggling though with issues like those that i just mentioned the abortion, homosexuality, violence, moral decay, all of that. And the solution? Simple. Turn it over to God. That's the solution. Turn it over to God. Submit those things. It doesn't just end with that. Listen. Submit those things to serious study of God's holy and flawless word. You'll find that no matter how contemporary the problem is, the deeper answers, the ones that really matter, are always found in God's timeless word. Amen. If you're struggling with how to deal with aging parents who need critical care, maybe it's a teenager who uh, has been caught experimenting with uh, drugs or alcohol, the solution is to seek the face of Christ in his revealed word. You might simply pray, Lord, my soul is weary with sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word. I think one of the last things I put in your notes, if you're struggling with, do I keep this job or is it time to move on? Do I give mercy or do I give tough love to a person who's offended me? Uh, what do I do with all these intense temptations that I'm being bombarded with? Men, go to the word. That's the solution. Hold fast to the word of life, Paul tells us here. Psalm 119.9 is a familiar passage. How can a young man, and we could say any man, how can any person, how can a young man keep his way pure? 
by guarding it according to your word. Men, we have to know the word. We have to be in the word. We have to hold fast to the word. What is the word to you, friends? Is it an ancient, an ancient dusty book just sitting on a shelf somewhere? Is it a nice guide, but it's outdated, it's outmoded in this sophisticated world in which we live today? Or is it the very words of truth, God-breathed, infallible truth itself? I'll conclude with this. Uh, just the other night, Monday night, in fact, I was getting ready to go to bed. Most of you know I'm a late, late, late night owl. It was a few minutes before midnight. I'm getting ready to go to bed, which is early for me, by the way. And uh, because I knew I had to get up early Tuesday morning. <clears throat> well, I hadn't looked at my email because I'd been studying most of the day. And so I just opened it up. I don't know why. I'm an idiot sometimes uh, because I get caught and then it's another 30 minutes or something like that. I open up my email and I see an email from a dear friend, a brother that I love, a brother that I trust. It had come Monday afternoon. And there was an article attached to it. And I, I just, I know now, I believe it was the Lord just leading me to, to read that because it really connected with what we're talking about today here in Philippians chapter 2. Here's just the first paragraph. I got into the article and I read the whole article, but here's the first paragraph. There are many components to staying healthy spiritually over the long term. You need a close circle of friends for support and accountability. You need to pray. You need to cultivate an interior life that is greater than your exterior life. Amen. But here's what I find, the writer said. It is so simple, you might dismiss it. But I can't. It's just always true. The more I engage the scriptures, the more I engage God. Hold fast to the word of life. Not because, we're not trying to get into bibliolatry, the worship and the idolization of a book. No, the Bible is the living word of God. That's where we get our instruction. That's where we get our evidence. That's where, that's where we go to. It's a foundation for us. This guy went on and said, when I read the Bible personally, I grow closer to God. When I skip or skim, I don't. And this is also the area in which I find many leaders and so many Christians struggling, end quote. Men, Paul tells us in our passage today what our course of action is. We must hold fast to the word of God. Sola Scriptura. Scripture alone. That is our final authority. So man, I challenge you, even as you leave today, be men who hold fast to the word of life. Get in it. Stay in it. Bring others with you to it. Father, thank you for our time together. I love these men. I love the fact that we are all imperfect. But Lord, we want, to, we want to be men who are best known by our friends and our family and even those who maybe don't know us yet. We want to be best known as men who are followers of Jesus. And so God, today I pray that you might give opportunity for us to Show Christ. Be Christ in skin as such. Lord, just fill us with your spirit and use us today, Lord. And I pray that you would give us all a deeper hunger for your word. And Lord, may we apply a grip on it Lord, that we will never release. God, help us to be light. Help us to be salt today in a world that desperately needs us. 
Well, Lord, thank you for the privilege that is ours. We know you don't need us. But you want to use us. So, Lord, I pray that many in this room will make themselves absolutely available. We will consecrate. We will surrender ourselves to you again today for your glory, for our good. We pray this in Christ's name. All God's men said, amen. Amen. All right, guys, let's live for him today, all right?